start off, I'd like to read something. Uh, it's not something I normally do, but I think it's quite apt for this. Citizens enjoy freedom of speech, of the press, of assembly, and of association. Citizens enjoy freedom of religious beliefs. Freedom of the person of citizens is inviolable. Freedom and privacy of correspondence of citizens are protected by law. Citizens have the right to criticize and make suggestions regarding any state organ. These are the words of the Constitution of the People's Republic of China. So, it's very interesting for me, because I come from such a world where what is written is not necessarily what is enforced. And so living here in Europe, and as Pavel mentioned, now in Switzerland, it's very common to come across people who say like, okay, no, my data is now secured because of GDPR, because of privacy regulations. There is a country that shall not be named where if a police officer catches you with even just a small amount of marijuana, that officer is allowed to completely ignore the, due, the requirement of due process of law, take out his gun, and shoot you in the head. That police officer will then receive a bonus. So, on one side, some people like to take control over just complete ignorance, uh, ignoring whatever rules are in place. And I come from such a place, and so for me, um, just relying on regulations is insufficient. And sometimes they even try to mo modify the regulations with these exemptions that they give themselves in mind. In the exact same country, last year they have lowered the age of criminal uh, responsibility to the age of 12. So police officers can now do that to kids as young as 12. If that's how much they value human life, what do you think they value privacy? It's, not, it's nothing for them. And so I decided to have this presentation about decentralizing oneself. Um, I know it's a little bit, it's supposed to be a workshop. Um, I usually give more like talks and inspirational speeches. This is going to be somewhere some in between um, because really uh, as the presentation goes on, you'll realize that a lot of the things that I'm going to give you are more of like tools and ways to help you understand yourselves better, um, better equip yourself for what's about to become, what's about to come. Um, it's because at the end of the day, it really comes to your preferences. As uh, Pavel mentioned, I've lived in many different countries. Some of these choices that I've made of where to go um, were because of restrictions that were given to me. As a Philippine passport holder, I can only enter visa-free to 34 different countries around the world. That's four more than last year, so I guess that's a good thing. Um, but also a lot of it was just because of personal preference. Uh, Svalbard is in the North Pole. Probably not a lot of people would like to live there. So again, I'm from the Philippines, and eventually I've lived in all of these places. A lot of it was fairly unintentional. Uh, that flag there, again, is not Norway, that's Valbard, that's where it is. Again, very cold. And something was quite interesting um, as I lived through all of this, because I didn't intend to decentralize myself, but that's what ended up happening. If you look me up online and really try to find my address, you will probably find about five to six different official addresses somewhere in these areas. Somehow I've even managed to get a mailing address to be one of the official addresses that I've had. And I realized slowly that you know, a lot of these things that have happened to me in, unintentionally can be quite beneficial for people that are trying to remain more private, other because, either because of security reasons, you might have somebody trying to come after you, especially in the cryptocurrency space, especially if um, I've, I've received a number of death threats already because I may be didn't praise the project well enough, and so the price went down, and they said it's my fault that they lost money and things like that. Um, or just, you know, wanting to be more secure and wanting that your information out there is not um, that accurate. So it's what I like to call hiding in plain sight. If you look at my LinkedIn profile, you'll see a crap ton of information. I've put a lot of information there about the courses I've taken, uh, the universities I've been to, even the ones that I didn't finish. And that's intentional, because then when you look at my profile, if you're a government official or somebody who's 
at the border control. Um, a lot of times I actually cite my LinkedIn profile whenever I try to say like, yes, I'm an okay person. Please let me in your country for three days. They can see that everything's there. And probably at some point they stop looking because they say, okay, everything's here. We can just check it whenever we want to. Um, and if you probably have some information out there that's easily accessible, but ones that you're fine with having out there, you can feel a bit more secure because if someone would really try to find the truth, they're going to have a very, very hard time doing it. This also applies, of course, to automated searches and things like that. Again, if you look up my name, lots of different addresses, lots of different birthdays as well. It's, amu it's amazing to me how many people just put their birthday out there. That's one of the key informations to tie back to you for social engineering attacks. So one quick tip, have numerous different birthdays out there. What I like to do, I take my uh, favorite musician's birthdays and just put it up there and change the year. It works quite well. And so yeah, decentralization is also a scale. Um, I do not have thousands of residents, hundreds of residencies. I do not have more than one passport, but I still consider myself very decentralized. Um, a lot of people were talking about, you know, do you feel super at home in Switzerland? It's like, well, yes, but I also travel around a lot. And I think that there's a big misconception also when people say that you must have these different passports, these different residencies, these different businesses, five businesses around the world. That's not true. Do it at your own pace and do it what you're comfortable with and find out exactly what you need. And that's what this workshop is going to be about. So one way, as I mentioned, is citizenships and passports. I'm not going to talk about this at all because um, the minimum price for this is around 125,000 US dollars. And honestly, if you had that kind of money to just spend, you probably are better off hiring a specialist <laughs> uh, to deal with your personal situation. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. But that is an option, of course. Next is residencies. I will be talking a little bit about that. Uh, Pavel was actually one of the uh, key information providers. Another one is business registration, connections, and lastly, knowledge and understanding. For knowledge and understanding, it's not, I, I would say it's not really the starting step, but it's something that you need to do. It's amazing to me to meet people and say, oh, I want to create a company in Seychelles without understanding anything about what Seychelles is where it even is on the map. Um, all they know, it costs a couple hundred, under a thousand US dollars to set up and have zero understanding. Let me bring up a case where this kind of really played out in real life. So maybe you want to think, yeah, where should I decentralize myself? This is Hong Kong. This is something that I'm sure everyone here and people watching, where's the camera? up there, um, know about what's going on. I'm not, I wasn't surprised at all. And anyone who properly understood Hong Kong history would have understood that this was not an if, this was a when. In 1842, in the Treaty of Nanking, Hong Kong Island was ceded to the United Kingdom uh, in perpetuity. In, 19, in 1860, the Kowloon Peninsula and the Stonecutters Island was also ceded in perpetuity. Oops. So why did the UK have to hand over Hong Kong? A lot of people talk about the 99-year lease. None of those were 99-year leases. And it's quite complex. I'm not going to go over everything. But basically, the UK tried to negotiate, Thatcher tried to talk to the Chinese government. The Chinese government said, well, you know, we could just invade. And there's nothing really much you could do about it. Of course, there's a lot of other aspects around there where they talked even until the end where they had an argument about how the flag raising and flag dropping were to go forward. But this answer is simple. Had no choice. And if you think about that deeply, that in the 80s, that a country was just willing to give out something to another country that was saying that, hey, we're just going to invade you if you don't give it to us. This is not that surprising anymore. And yet many businesses said, like, okay, yeah, no, Hong Kong's still a great place. And it was. But all of the really good business people that I know in Hong Kong or set up a business there always had an exit plan. Unfortunately, not everyone. Again, it was those people who did not understand and did not spend their time researching and understanding how the country actually operates uh, that, well, 
they're entering into some severe issues right now. So what to learn? Quite basic, basic history. Um, international relations, this is something that uh, goes just beyond friendships and treaties and stuff like that. You have to think about um, when you have your data in such a country, what are they going to do with it? A lot of people have told me, oh, I don't care if Russia has my data. I don't care if um, China has my data, which is fine. It's fine. If that's in your comfort zone, that's okay. But have you ever uh, considered the possibility of them selling the data to the people that you don't like? If you have, great, but most people haven't. If there's something that your enemy wants and your friend has it, don't always trust that your friend isn't going to sell it to your enemy. Of course, depending how close you are to them. Economy, how self-sustaining it is, whether, for example, if you're considering that as a getaway place as well, um, how re self-reliant is it on its own? And the different cultures, of course, it's very important to, to understand this also in the terms of, like, you know, would having an online conversation work as well as in person? I think here in Europe, that's mostly okay to just have a Zoom call or Skype call or whatever. Um, but we're in, I'm from in the Philippines, in South America. A lot of these things don't go very well. Um, some countries, you really need to even have a meal with a person in order for the deal to be finalized. And lastly, politics. I think that's very self-explanatory. So where to learn? Well, there's a lot of really resources out there. The two ones that I can recommend are Geography Now um, and History Matters. Geography Now, they have videos ranging from 10 minutes to 25. Obviously, the larger countries get a larger amount. History Matters used to be 10 history in 10 minutes or something like that, and so a lot of their videos are 10 minutes or less. Uh, highly recommend them. Actually, a lot of the information about the Hong Kong one I got from a four-minute video from them a few months ago. I'll have all of my slides available as well, by the way. So travel also, obviously, is a very beneficial thing, actually going there and understanding how things are. Yes, now it's not the best time, but perhaps, hopefully, sometime in the future, you'll be able to do that because it's a great way to build connections. So in all of these countries, as Pavel mentioned, I've had multiple residencies. There's one country here I don't actually have residency in and never did, Fiji. I've only lived there for four months. I was there throughout my entire you know, uh, permit to stay there without a visa, so just a stamp on my passport, which is amazing as a Philippine passport holder to be able to stay somewhere with just a stamp. And I consider that I, I did reside there because I know that I can go back there anytime and I'll have very close friends that I can just go back to in the village and stay with them if they need to. If I need to, sorry. And that's one thing that I want to point out. It's like, I don't have a residency there, but still I feel a very strong connection. The country has a very strong connection to me. I have a very good understanding of how Fiji works. I lived there during the dictatorship. I do not recommend that anybody do that. I don't, that was one of the things that I should have understood before actually going there, um, at least a little bit more. But yeah, just frequently going to a place um, building good connections in an area can make you very much connected there because you can have a lot of working relationships, and this could lead to also having multiple income streams. Remember, decentralizing yourself also is not just in terms of residencies and connections and all of this, but also where your money is coming from. If all of your money is coming from, let's say, the one country that you don't really like to be associated with, or it's the country that you're from, then you might really not get as decentralized as you think you are. How to move forward with this, especially because you can't travel too much. Uh, one is warm introductions. Um, this is an offer that I will have for everybody here in the workshop, as well as everyone watching online. If there's anybody within my network, um, I have a large LinkedIn contact list, and I only add them if I've actually spoken with them or have worked with them. If you need any introduction to any of those countries or people there, please let me know. I'd be happy to make that introduction for you. Um, but yeah, also reach out to your own network and try to see if maybe there's a country that you're interested in, that you've done some research, and you're interested in um, actually speaking with somebody from there and trying to get along on a personal and professional basis. Another one is using the um, cross-border chambers of commerce. I did not think that this existed until this year, actually, until I found out that there's actually even a uh, Swiss-Paraguayan 
Chamber of Commerce in Paraguay. So it actually helps a lot of people in Switzerland who are interested in doing business in Paraguay um, and also just general trade between both countries. Um, I don't think there are that many around, but try to take a look um, if there's a place from wherever you're living and wherever you want to go or have a connection to. These places are usually quite helpful in terms of providing you information. Um, and even if you want to try to do some volunteering stuff with them, uh, they're very much open to it, and it's a great way to get some work experience and gain some contacts. Last one is um, next one is cross-border associations and communities. Um, this one is a little bit uh, dependent on whether there's a lot of people from where you're from in that country. Like, for example, in the United States, in the city of Seattle, there's actually a Swedish cultural center, which has then expanded to being really a Scandinavian cultural center. So... If there's anyone from Scandinavia here who's in interested there, uh, you could just look that up and yeah, get, try to get connected that way. Travel, again, not too possible right now. Uh, and last, online communities. I mean, we're, right now this conference is partly online, and Reddit is actually a great way uh, to get the connections. And some of the times these actually come in much, very handy, uh, even if you already have a lot of personal connections. So for example, uh, one of the flags you saw up there was Austria. And the second time I lived in Austria, I had a lot of difficulties getting my residence permit and actually being able to go. Um, quick overview, it takes five months for them to process the residence permit application. After doing that, I have to apply for the visa, and then I fly in, and then I have to collect some papers to get the final card. Uh, so all in all, that's about seven months just for me to get a residence permit to be there for more than six months. And it was taking too long, there were too many problems, and I just started a rant on the Austrian subreddit. And a lawyer reached out to me, and he just said, I'll help you for free. I feel so bad for your situation. I've never spoken with this guy. He has no idea who I am. I haven't been doing this back then. And he just did that. He went to the immigration office all the time and um, accompanied me also when I needed to pick up the card. And he just asked me to donate 200 euros to his charity. And so I did. But 200 euros for all of the help he, made, he just gave me it was, was tremendous. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, rely on such people existing and helping you out all the time, but there's actually a significant amount of people who understand the pains uh, of all of this and are willing to lend a helping hand. And that's actually how I'm here today. I wouldn't have been here uh, without the help of many of my friends and just random strangers whom I have no idea what their name is. And it's really, I mean, it's up to you how you want to leverage this. Um, a lot of people might feel a bit uncomfortable. They don't want it to go too much beyond friendship. They want to uh, just keep it that way. That's fine. Having friends is a great thing. Um, sometimes, again, you might consider a place a runaway place. So for me, some places in the Pacific Islands are. Um, in some places, you don't want to you know, have a runaway place, but more of just like, I'm interested in doing business here and maybe setting up a business here in the future, something like that. And that's really up to what you feel like, what you want, and your own personal situations. Which then leads me to business registration. Um, there's a big misconception that you must have a product to sell or uh, you need to have a team, and that's really not required. I mean, in my own company, uh, right now in my consulting company, I'm the only person. Um, and it's been quite helpful just having a corporate entity. I mean, now I live in the country where my corporate entity is set up, but it was very helpful when I was a resident of the Czech Republic and when I was still living in Svalbard, having an entity in Switzerland. Um, and not just because it was in Switzerland, but just having one that wasn't there. And one reason is because you can route your employment through your business entity. And so if you're concerned about certain things like um, tax, tax over taxation or just things like, you know, maybe something that you don't want to associate yourself with. Um, my consulting company, I've used that to consult for maybe some projects that I didn't, have, I didn't want to be associated too strongly because I didn't believe in their product so much. Uh, but of course, I was willing to take their money in, in terms of playing devil's advocate. And for me, when I was reporting it uh, then as a self-employed person, all they could see is invoicing my own company. And it worked quite well. Um, it was also beneficial, I mean, not, maybe not here in the Czech Republic, but if you're living in a country uh, that does not treat cryptocurrency payments very well and you want to report it for whatever reason, maybe immigration or otherwise, um, having it through a company that does the conversion for you um, is a great way to just get money in and have a very simple tax reporting at the end of the year for you personally. So out of 32 countries that I've looked up uh, and tried to gather a lot of data on, these are the eight that I'm going to go over just a little bit. Um, 
I should point out that one IBC has been kind enough to spend a lot of hours with me uh, just trying to go back and forth and answering all of my questions. So I have some affiliation with them. Uh, Affinity Group gave me all of the information about the Isle of Man. Also, the, uh, my logo's, the logo's missing there, but the digital Isle of Man, they've been very helpful in making sure the information has been correct. Um, I have a good contact also at One IBC and Affinity, and they have both expressed to me that if anybody here has any questions, also online, um, I'm, I can make the introduction, and it's no, no selling at all. It's just to share information about these countries. Um, I also have the full fact sheets of each of these, and I'm happy to send that over. I'm not having them on the presentation because there's too much information. So the first one I'll go over is Bahamas. Let me just quickly run through this information here. Uh, so the total cost includes the filing expenses and the legal expenses. Renewal costs include any of the uh, recurring expenses that's needed, perhaps office registration and things like that. Um, local directors, some, company, some countries require that somebody is actually there presently, uh, in pre um, physically, sorry. And uh, that can just be a proxy director, but obviously that's an additional cost. Um, if you have a friend there, then that's great. Annual returns, so that's for the tax reporting. Uh, accounts preparation, uh, it was a bit strange for me when I first found this out a couple of years ago. There are some countries that require you to prepare the accounts, but you don't actually have to send it. Um, I was told that the reason for this is that if ever there is a government-mandated audit, then you must have it ready. Uh, but you actually don't need to be proactive in, in sharing the information. Um, how exactly you keep it, it varies from country to country. Uh, public shareholder records, I'm happy to say all of these are pretty much on the no side. I wouldn't have included it here uh, if it was no. Um, so yeah, that's Bahamas. It's uh, very big on tourism. It's in the Caribbean. Johnny Depp lives there, so it actually has a pirate of the Caribbean. Next is uh, Mauritius. Um, this one's a little bit more expensive. Uh, it's a very big place for fintech. It's a very multi-ethnic uh, community, so if it's actually a country that you're interested in moving into, um, this could be something that uh, you could consider. There's a lot of people who have Europe, uh, from European descent, a lot of Asian descent, and African descent from here as well. And it's the only place in the world where the dodo bird was the uh, native animal. Um, and should point out that here, yes, the annual tax return, you actually do have to... Um, provide it. Uh, for, all of these for all of these countries, all foreign sourced income uh, has 0% taxation. Um, for most of them also with capital gains. So the Nevis, uh, a lot of people like to think of St. Kitts and the Nevis as one country, but it's actually a federation. Um, St. Kitts and the Nevis is also a good place to have it, but I decided to pick Nevis because the costs were significantly lower. As you can see, there's just 1,500 and 1,400 for monthly uh, uh, yearly, sorry, um, renewals. Oh, by the way, quick disclaimer on the costs. Um, please do also, if you are going to move forward with the business creation, please do take a look also at the competitors of 1IBC. I'm not here to, to sell them. This is just, I'm using this just as a benchmark. So you might see some other companies that charge higher and some that charge lower. And of course, you can find out ways to, to make it cheaper as well. And so yeah, here it's pretty much the same. It's very fast, just three days. Um, if you like mangoes, they have 50 different varieties of mangoes, um, but none of them as good as the mango from my hometown of Cebu. So Cayman Islands, of course, that's a very uh, common choice, um, but as you can see, it's very expensive just because of the sheer demand of companies that are people who are looking to set up companies there. Um, also, it's still fairly fast, uh, and annual return um, is a yes. Also, interestingly, yeah, the cost difference uh, is not so much different. Um, I've seen some companies actually ask for $6,000 for this as well, but uh, those seem to be for more specialist stuff. Um, yeah, that's also another thing I should point out. If you're doing something uh, that might require additional licenses, these costs um, probably throw them out the window if you need more licenses. Then I'm just using this for more standard cases. Panama is another one that's uh, quite interesting. I'll be talking a, bit, a little bit more about this um, with the residency part, but uh, these are the costs uh, through one IPC. Again, mostly nose, which is great. Seychelles, what? what is it? There. So one of the most popular ones, and interestingly, um, there's a current case um, with this company called BitMEX. So if you're in cryptocurrency trading place, you probably know what that is, but if you're not, it's an exchange uh, that allows you to go up to 100x in leverage. So almost like a casino, really. And I recommend that you follow that case if you're interested in setting up a company in Seychelles because it sets up a precedent uh, in terms of how 
people get sued if their Seychelles, Seychelles company uh, operates in a way that their hometown country does not like. Um, actually, Seychelles has a very positive banking stance now. I was very surprised to see that this year. I was talking with a variety of banks in Switzerland uh, and around Europe, and I just asked them their opinion on Seychelles, just out of sheer curiosity. And actually, they all said that, yeah, Seychelles is not in the blacklist anymore. We're happy to onboard Seychelles companies. Actually, they considered Maltese companies a little bit more uh, on the blacklist rather than Seychelles companies. So, um, They've done a lot on that end, uh, and it's still fairly cheap. I, and most, I mean, everything is just on a no here. And I, I would actually give you some urgency if, uh, if the BitMEX case works out well in, in their favor um, and the positive banking stance continues to go forward because I'm assuming the demand for Seychelles company will go up uh, in the near future. So these costs are fairly low right now, but they might go up soon. Bitmax, uh, Max, M E X. Yep, no problem. Vanuatu is another one that's very, very interesting. Um, I actually had my own business in Vanuatu as well, and just as an experiment, also I tried to set up bank accounts for the company, uh, tried to create cryptocurrency exchange accounts. I was able to do that. It took six months, uh, but I was able to do it, and. Um, Sadly, I had to close it because actually Vanuatu ended up in the red zone. So I, I can't fully recommend it, but I still decided to put it up here because it's still uh, very favorable. Um, I wish to just let you know that it's under scrutiny at the moment, and a lot of countries tend to be very hesitant when they see an invoice to a Vanuatu company. Um, that said, if you are planning to have some presence of yourself uh, with your data in the Pacific Islands, it's very hard to set up a company there. I would actually recommend for now against um, having one in Fiji uh, because the political instability there is just too great. There's been three coups in the last uh, 30 years. Um, so it's not very secure in terms of you know, what could actually be there. Um, so Vanuatu has been fairly stable, so that's why I decided to, to keep it up here. And in general, if you have one business in any of the Pacific Island countries, it's easier to do business with other Pacific Island nations. So the Isle of Man uh, is probably the most expensive out of all of these and has more yeses. It's still on the no on the public shareholder records. Um, because of the local director requirement, the costs are much higher. But I decided to put it on here because um, the blockchain Isle of Man and the digital Isle of Man program uh, hosted by their government um, is actually having relocation programs where they're willing to give a certain amount of money to help you move there if you are interested in moving there. Um, that's as long as you provide some sort of like innovative service or have an innovative product. Um, so even if you're a consultant, actually, you don't need to have uh, made something. If you can just show that, yeah, I've consulted a lot of different projects, that's even good enough for them to consider you on a specialist visa. Um, of course, this is still on a case-by-case -case basis. There's also a lot of grants that's there. Um, and even though if maybe they're not uh, on the Swiss level in terms of secrecy, which really Switzerland's not too big on banking secrecy anymore, that's a old time thing, um, it's, uh, they still treat uh, confidentiality uh, very strongly. And they're actually also actively trying to expand beyond just iGaming. So they're very open to having you in the conversation. And one nice thing also, it's a very small uh, country. Uh, they are connected to the United Kingdom, of course, but they will actually try to consult with you if they feel that you're an expert on a certain topic. So you have a way to even influence their government a little bit, um, which can be very beneficial, not just for you, um, but if you care for certain causes and things like that, um, could really help out a lot. And that's actually one reason why I uh, keep uh, in close contact with them. So where are these countries? Singapore I didn't include because uh, the costs are very high to set up a company there. The tax is low but actually it increases every year until the third year. So a lot of companies out there will try to say like, oh, look at this tax rate in, in Singapore, but actually like if you look at the next year, it goes up, and then the year after it goes up, and then you're paying standard tax rates. Probably still lower than many places in Europe, but not as low as many people think when they get into it, and they've already sunk so much money in, they just keep it there. Not all the time, but sometimes. Cyprus I removed because last year uh, they had now the tax of 12.5%. Um, they are in the EU, so a lot of the data can be transferred quite easily. Switzerland, um, for holding company tax benefits, that was last year was the last year that their tax benefits would have existed, so actually the, the benefits are not 
too great anymore by having a holding company there. Um, me as a Swiss resident actually makes zero sense to have a Swiss holding company even. So there's so many holding companies that are being shut down and just dividends being distributed. Um, USA, uh, Delaware, and Wyoming are two big countries that a lot of people talk about. I'm not including them because of, yeah, privacy violations, numerous. Uh, yeah, even if taxes are lower. Um, I'm not saying these countries are bad. Um, definitely, if in your own personal situations, like if you want to move to the US, maybe those two states are great to have the company. Um, Switzerland, I mean, I live there um, for a multitude of different reasons. And uh, it's still possible to set up a business there and still be able to operate in a very internationally renowned way. It's just didn't feel that it was the main thing for this talk right now. So important notes. Um, if wherever possible, use cryptocurrencies for easier asset transfer. Um, setting up a bank account for each of these um, company, uh, countries, it's not the easiest. In Vanuatu, it costs about $25,000, even if you don't do anything that's crazy. Uh, Seychelles is also somewhere between ten and $20,000, uh, depending on your relationship with the bank and in all of the other places, because you're not going to be there physically. Um, it might be expensive to have to hire a lawyer to sign on your behalf all the time. One IBC also provides that service, but even they say, like, yeah, it's quite expensive, um, and so they warn people in advance about it. One, other, one thing, though, is that local banking is not always required. Um, it can be a little bit difficult sometimes. Um, but uh, like with this company, so it's Euro Pacific Bank, I should point out that I do have a relationship with this bank. I am a referring agent. Um, so if you are interested, I can actually do the initial onboarding for you. Um, but yeah, as you can see, the cost structure here is very low. Um, it's a private bank, but without private banking costs other than the transfers. So incoming is receiving and outgoing is sending out. It, it is quite high. So I wouldn't use this uh, if you are doing many different transactions uh, with your company. But if you do need a bank, um, this one is, uh, is quite good. But if you are using cryptocurrencies, you cannot use this bank. I have tried to talk to them to become more crypto friendly, and they've actually been fairly uh, positive about cryptocurrencies, or at least neutral about it. But they have mentioned to me that a lot of their um, intermediary banks uh, have not uh, approved certain transactions from exchanges and things like that, even if you have all of your papers. So it's one or the other. Um, try to pay a little tax if you can. Um, I, I know that with zero tax is great because you don't have to pay almost anything, but um, just from my experience with setting up um, companies with zero tax and then trying to get them onto like exchanges and things like that, uh, one of the requirements is to submit uh, perhaps you know, some documents with regards to tax returns. And if you say, I don't have anything, um, well, they'll ask you to justify it. And then it goes to this whole subjective um, valid verification. And uh, you know, sometimes it can go well. If they're, very, if they're very knowledgeable about the country, then it'll go very smoothly. But if already they're very suspicious about you, it's going to be the burden of proof is going to be on your side. So uh, just keep that in mind. And I mean, even if you can just pay like some government fees here and there to apply for this license that you might not even use ever, uh, that's still very useful because then you can show that, yeah, I'm trying to do everything and being compliant. Um, basically, try to check the boxes uh, that may not be necessarily like solid boxes, but ones that they will be considered like the good to haves. Also, yeah, lastly, check with how you're taxed where you live. Uh, this might actually cause more problems for you uh, than good. I know in Spain, um, this does not solve your issue at all in terms of tax reduction um, or might even increase it in some cases. So please do that research on your own. Um, lastly, with the residency, I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to have to try to push through this one quickly. Uh, residency is not equal to passport. Uh, you don't get a passport when you have it, but uh, sometimes uh, yeah, you still get the right of entry. So it was very interesting when I had Czech residency and Swiss residency during the time of the lockdowns, I was one of the few people in the world who would be allowed to fly back and forth or at least drive back and forth because I could always say, I'm just going home. And they would have to let me through because I had the right of, of passage. Local status, so then you're able to get certain discounts that only local people can get. Um, they can, if you want to avail of some government services, you can do that. Um, some pri like phone numbers and things like that, sometimes they require that you actually be a resident of the country, um, which can be very useful if you want to put that phone number instead of your one here uh, whenever you're doing phone verification. Tax residency, of course, one thing that you can also get uh, just by having a residency somewhere else. Um, some international benefits. So for example, 
um, with Panama, which I'll be going over later, um, oh, sorry, Paraguay. If you are a resident of Paraguay, you get access to all of the Mercosur countries, although I think for people who don't have a passport as shitty as mine, um, you probably can go there visa-free anyway. But for people like me, it's great if I have uh, the Paraguayan uh, residency because then I can go to all of the Mercosur countries without having to apply for a visa. So it could even save you money, depending on what you want to do. So um, unfortunately, there's only two countries that I have on here, and it's because a lot of this process has been changing a lot in the past year. Uh, and also, uh, a lot of things are not very clear online in terms of the requirements and things like that. Uh, Paraguay had an asterisk because until today, uh, I didn't meet anyone who went through the process and actually got the card, but Pavel just informed me that he has it now. Um, so he can probably verify certain stuff here. Um, so Liberation Travel is the one that provided me a lot of this information. So I'm not able to go through the entire steps for each of those two countries because it's just too long. Um, but if you want more information, happy to make the introductions. And again, they're happy to talk to you about it. Uh, make sure you have your birth certificate, passport, proof of current residency, diplomas if you have any, and national police clearance. I have all of this in one folder. Um, I have multiple birth certificates because I've had that lost. Not by myself, not by the Postal Service, but by the freaking embassies. <laughs> they can lose documents, so have copies uh, wherever possible. And check if your country or the countries that have issued those documents are part of the Hague Convention. Um, because if they are not in the Hague Convention, that document will need to go through uh, the, relative, um, the respective Department of Foreign Affairs and then to the embassy of the country that you're sending it to, which can take quite a lot of time. So for example, for my police grants uh, in the Philippines, when I tried to move to the Czech Republic, um, somebody had to get it for me in, in Manila, um, take it to the Department of Foreign Affairs, have that notarized, and then the Czech embassy had to then um, authenticate it, which took a process of about two and a half months and about 750 euros, which was painful. So try to not have it. Ooh, it's not as clear as I would have liked. Um, yeah, so this is the information for, for Paraguay. The total cost is around $1,700. That includes all of the translation as well. Um, notable is that you don't actually need to uh, have been in Paraguay before. So you can start the application now. And the only time that you'll have to go is when you need your photo taken uh, for the card. It takes about three to six months. Um, right now, the estimates are kind of all over the place. And it also depends, of course, on how fast you can get your documents. Uh, physical presence is only actually one day every three years. Um, again, as I mentioned, access to Mercosur countries. Yeah, sorry, it's not that clear, but again, my slides will be available to everyone. Uh, and financial requirements, as you can see up there, uh, it's a deposit of about 4,500 United States dollars. It's actually in the Paraguayan currency, so it fluctuates a little bit. Um, or you can do the same and create a company there. Um, also, you could have a diploma, and I think that might be used as a uh, substitute for that. How much is the land? Sorry, the land? Oh. I haven't looked that up properly, sorry. Um, I think it varies also quite a lot. Paraguayan uh, history is, is very interesting. It's one of the only countries in the world, I think the only country in the world, to have outlawed same-race marriages, which is very strange. So um, a lot of their... Sorry? You are not allowed to marry the same race for a while. It's legal now, but... at Sometime in the past, it wasn't. So uh, it's, yeah, Paraguayan history and demographics and stuff like that is very interesting. So it's, it's also hard for me to get information because I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> um, Panama, uh, it's about the same, but it is more expensive. So as you can see, it's like gotten a lot more difficult and a lot more expensive. Even the Isle of Man uh, company setup will be a lot cheaper. And so legal application fees go up to around 5,000, but that's also accounting for the flights and hotels and all this stuff because you need to go there about three times before you can actually get the residency. Um, again, in, in terms of physical presence requirements, it's very low. It's only one day uh, for every two years. Uh, Liberation Travel has a full document on this that uh, I can check with Pavel if I can actually share that with all of you. Uh, but it goes over this a lot more. Sorry, I need to hurry up because I'm out of time. Deposit is $6,000. So actual residency approach. Remember to deregister from the place that you're actually physically in if you don't want to be registered there anymore. A lot of people forget this. Uh, and end up still getting taxed in their own residency uh, and having all of the data still there and not in the other country. Um, don't just rely on the card. Have a convincing story. At some point, you might be asked. You might be asked just, you know, 
by somebody official, and then uh, you know, and, and anything that's subjective, it might go against you if you can't really talk a little bit more about the country. Um, not when you're there, but when you're outside. Um, have an entity where you actually reside, have a business entity. Um, a lot of people try to just neglect that completely while living in the country that they're actually living in. Um, but if you're having a business there, you can use that business then for all of your purchases, um, renting your apartment, buying property, and things like that. That way then it doesn't get connected to you personally but, um, in that country, but instead you in the other country. So keep that in mind. Uh, and yeah, last thing, check tax treaties and rules. That's very important because, again, this might actually end up with you having to pay more taxes. So actual residency approach. So now it's about the actual, uh, actually being in a place, um, aka being a digital nomad. So as I mentioned, in Fiji, I didn't actually have residency there. Uh, instead, I was just, um, just around there. And uh, again, pe people ask, like, like, why would I choose to live there? And why would I go here, there, or wherever? Um, and it's just because of who I was at the time. At the time, I was really just looking for a little bit of an adventure and trying to go somewhere that I think I would never have gone back before. Um, I'm not, because of that, I'm not able to really have a step-by-step -step kind of thing with choosing which country to move to. That's really up to you. I'm happy to have the conversation with you one-on-one -on -one if you are interested. Um, I've known people from many different countries moving to many other different countries. Um, and yeah, just have some self-reflection. Um, if you, if you choose to want to move, understand that it's not easy. Um, I didn't own any furniture for about five years. And for some people, that's, you know, that's, that's not easy to think that you have two suitcases and a guitar, and that's all of your possessions. And if you lose one, crap, you lost half of everything. Um, and having to get rid of stuff is also a very painful process, saying goodbye to friends if you're not going to see them again, if you don't travel as much. I'm lucky that I get to travel a lot, so I don't usually have that issue. So yeah, last notes, Nomad Capitalist is a good resource. I'm sorry, I have to go fast. Um, try to get a foreign bank account. Europac Bank also has personal bank accounts. It's a bit cheaper. It's about half the price, not for transactions, but for setting up. Um, don't push further than what you need. A lot of people really, again, try to go really far, really fast, and then they end up in more bills than they actually want. Take things one step at a time. Try not to rush things uh, unless you want to throw in a lot more money to speed up the process. And lastly, be flexible. A lot of the places I moved to were not because I chose to at the time, but because I had to. And it's that flexibility that really was able to make me calm. Like people ask me, how the hell did you uh, survive that uh, endeavor, just having to lose everything and starting all over? Well, I learned to be flexible from a long time ago. So the fight against the digital totality for me is not just so much in terms of having all the encryption tools. Um, but trying to approach it in a more cunning way. Um, it's something that a lot of places try not to attack so much, again, by having misinformation out there. I'm not saying lie to the places, but um, if there's information you don't care about, put it up there. If there's information that you care about, try to keep it down, and they might think that you're already sharing too much information and just, okay, pass along, which is what happened for me many times. So that's my workshop. Thank you very much for listening. I'm here to answer any questions, and I'll be around until Sunday. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Trevin, uh, for your fascinating presentation. I hope we'll see each other in Paraguay or <laughs> Panama in the following month. I'm, I'm planning to, to travel to Paraguay like, uh, next month to pick okay. up my national ID. <laughs> I still can't get my police clearance. <laughs> yeah, so, so. If, you want, if you want to join me or join us to, uh, with the Travels to Paraguay or Panama, let us know after the conference. Yeah, cool. Uh, and I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. So ask. Yeah. Portugal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was supposed to go over it a little bit, but the person who, uh, I, I wasn't able to get the right information. And I also realized that most of the attendees are European, so you guys can just literally go there without much of a problem. Uh, and so, like, if I was going to talk about the process, I, I didn't think it would be that relevant. So I said skip it for now. But if you'd like, when I get the proper information, I can send it to you. Oh. Okay. 
Yeah, the thing is that what I know, like some of my friends that uh, they got uh, permanent residency in Portugal, Portugal is probably not, not one of the best European country mm -hmm. if you are involved in crypto because you have a no obligation to tax your crypto if you have Portugal uh, tax residency. For Portuguese, five, Portuguese tax residency. I think it's for five to ten years. Yeah, right now. Yeah. yeah. I think it's temporary, like everything in Europe is temporary, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but that one you actually have to like live there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just be flexible. Yeah. Another questions? Okay, wait a moment. I'm going to bring you the microphone. What do you think about the um, Estonia e-resident thing? I mean, it doesn't really do anything. A lot of people have brought that suggestion to me because you get residency, but you don't. All you can do with that card is sign documents legally, digitally. That's it, which is great, which is great. I'm not saying it's bad. But it doesn't do anything in terms of residency. In terms for me, I still need to set up a company there uh, if I want an Estonian visa. Um, $8,000 uh, euros, um, not including legal expenses, not including office. And then, um, yeah, okay, like I'd be able to move there that way. But the card didn't do anything other than allow me to sign the document. So, yes, it's a cost cutter, maybe. But other than that, it doesn't do much. Yeah, and you can. Free buses as well. Free buses? Okay, that's new. Oh, okay. Did not know that. Yeah, so, so this Estonian residence is not a real residence. No, it's not. It just uh, it means you you can just interact with their e-government services. That's all. Yeah, it's a it a bit fraudulent in my opinion, but yeah. yeah, that's my opinion. Okay. Some other questions? Maybe last questions. If you have any question, okay. I just have a practical question sure. because uh, you mentioned the total cost, but what is it actually that is in the total costs? So uh, for the total cost, it covers all of the legal expenses. Um, I tried to also include any translation expenses that might be needed. Of course, a lot of these are estimates. Um, you can translate on your own if you can. Um, all of the government filing fees, all of the you know, fees all the way from the filing all the way to the processing and everything like that. So I tried to include as much as possible in there so there were no hidden fees, but I, I haven't gone through the process for all of these countries, so I can't really like attest to them. Um, but at least with the ones from 1IBC, they've been very upfront with me about it. Um, there are perhaps some additional costs if you do something unique. Um, and th those ones I didn't include because I wanted this just for the standard, you know, like as a consultant kind of company. Um, yeah, and the recurring costs, uh, that one also included like the first year office, if an office was required. And if a local director was required for that country, I also included that fee there. Um, for, the, for the office fee, I tried to take the average instead of getting the lowest one, because that way you'd be happy if you see something cheaper. Uh, the recurring costs included uh, accountant to do all of the accounting, reporting, um, whether or not it's sent, uh, the office registration and any other fees in order to keep it up. Um, also, local director yearly fee and things like that. Um, yeah.